So now that I have this uh, complete drum track, we're going to move on to other instruments. But before I do that, I thought maybe some of you would be interested to know what's going on in this area over here. You probably noticed this red line. Um, I'm going to turn this, uh, turn my drum track off for a moment and just focus in on what's going on there. At the end of the song, there's this crash and then the drummer plays this like, they sort of like tinkle on the cymbals really, really fast. And uh, I wanted to do something to simulate that sound. So uh, here's what it sounds like on the original recording. So that's like where they have, you know, they do the big crash and then they hit the two cymbals left and right really hard uh, at first and then softer and progressively softer and softer. So that's this area down here on the track. So what I did was I put in 30 second notes for two bars on this one instrument, the 17 inch crash, and then I put a loud crash on uh, the 16 inch crash here. And what I did was I selected all of these notes and you can see as I select these notes, the velocities for those notes turn dark. And then I went uh, Command B to turn on the draw mode, and I drew in a velocity pattern that was, you know, for, sort of random because that's what happens when you're actually playing. You don't hit everything with the same hardness when you're doing these kind of like swell things. So I wanted something that sort of slowly got softer and softer and softer. So if you if you hit the digital drum softer and softer and softer, or the digital cymbal in this case, not only does it get softer, but the actual tone of the drum changes. So uh, here's what mine sounds like. So you have the sound of those two drums, or those two cymbals, riding over top of each other. So I did uh, a copy of these 30 second notes on both of those two different cymbals and then I did different velocity patterns for the two cymbals that makes it sound a little more realistic, a little more alive. So uh, this is the pattern for this set of cymbals, this dark one, or this particular cymbal, and then this one down here is the pattern for this cymbal. Okay, see how that's the one that has this little peak here. And it's not really important exactly what the pattern was. It just needed to be soft and it needed to slowly descend down to nothing. So that's what I did to try to simulate the sound of that crash at the end. But you could just as easily just have a kick and a crash and that's it. And not do all that extra stuff. I just wanted, you know, to try to simulate that sound. Just sort of testing myself out. Testing out my own abilities on this thing. Try to get it to do as much as I can. So, one of the things we didn't talk about is the way that Ableton handles automation. We did talk about digital mixers, digital workstations that allow you to program mixer movements. So if you had, say, a fader that you wanted to go up and down at a certain speed or a certain pattern, you would be able to program that fader, and it's got a little motor in it, and it turns the fader up and down based on the programming that you've done to it. Well, Ableton does that through the use of automation lanes. So I'm just going to open this one up. <coughs> what this is, is an automation lane, that, or an automation line rather, it's not in its own lane yet, we can do that too, but um, this line shows the height of a certain fader, and I'm selected what that fader is, it is the reverb send, so the A uh, returns, I haven't talked yet about how the returns are set up, but <coughs> Basically, there's two return tracks in Ableton that pop up automatically. You can have as many as you want, but two of them pop up automatically. And uh, one of them already comes preloaded with a reverb, and one comes preloaded with a uh, delay. And you can see these when you turn on your uh, R over here. If I turn it off, you can see that they uh, disappear from down here at the bottom. Uh, if I hit Tab and flip over to... Uh, session view, you can see them over here on the right. Here's the track for reverb and the track for delay. So the way this works is that you've got A and B sends on every channel and then when you turn up the send for that channel it's going to borrow the sound of this channel, whatever's coming through here, in this case drums, and it's going to send it 
over to the reverb channel. In this case, A here is the reverb channel, A. So it borrows the drum sound and sends it over to the reverb channel. And then that processes, if I click on here, you can see that I've got reverb set up on this channel. So it gives reverb to all the signal coming into that channel and then puts it out through its own channel. So you have independent control of the reverb that's coming through there. Same thing with the delay. I can turn up the delay send on this channel and that sends a copy of that sound to the delay. If I start it again, you'll be able to hear, um, let's see, my drums are on and nothing else is on at this point. Um, so when I hit play again, you'll be able to see the signal coming through this channel and because these have been turned up, you can just turn them up and down like that. Um, because they're turned up, you're going to see audio here in this reverb channel. And in the delay channel as well. And you'll see the volume of these changing, and they have a little red square next to them. So the way that works is this is the change in volume that I created for the reverb send for this channel. So as I clicked and made a waypoint and then moved that waypoint up and moved it over, that changes the volume of the reverb send for that period of time. So you, as this goes up and jumps back down or slowly goes back down, you'll see that change here. See how the reverb send is coming down. And then I also have some automation on the delay channel, which I've got zero delay and infinite, so it says minus infinite, that's infinite uh, reduction in gain. So my delay channel comes on and then it slowly decreases as well. So this is this one on the right. And I did that just to make the, the sound more natural. You don't have to duplicate that at this point. I'm going to have a whole section on automation later in the course. I just wanted you to know what was going on with those red bars so that you weren't uh, thinking that this is something you needed to have on your, uh, on your project right away. So the next thing we're going to do is add a track for bass, and we're going to sample some uh, bass sounds and see if we can find a sound that we want to use to create a, a MIDI bass track. Some of you may want to record live bass, but we're going to do both. We're going to do a MIDI bass track and do a live bass track. So I'm going to come over here to my instruments and audition some of the uh, bass instruments. You'll find that a lot of what Ableton offers is uh, very electronic-y sounding, but it also has some natural sounds as well. So these are all kind of electronic-y sounding. So we'll go out of this uh, analog instrument and go into, uh, let's try the instrument rack. Are all kind of electronic -y as well. I'm trying to remember where I had the. Um... the like uh, normal sounding ones.
So all we really want right now is a bass that um, sounds kind of normal. And since we're doing a MIDI track, we can always add, uh, we can always play with the sound later and change it to something sort of more normal. <laughs> Now let's just go with this one for now. Drop that instrument on there. And one of the things you can do if you don't find yourself in front of a computer workstation that has a keyboard is you can use your computer keyboard to play notes in. All you have to do is make sure this little icon here with the keyboard is turned on and that your channel that you're trying to uh, play into is armed. And if you play the row that goes from A to L through the middle of your keyboard, that's going to give you a, 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 a sort of makeshift MIDI keyboard. You can go up and down an octave using Z and X. So I'm going to hit the Z button one time. That brings me down an octave. And then I hit it again. Okay. And then uh, the W, so that, that's, the, uh, that's a major scale you may have noticed. Uh, but then you can also do the pitches in between. W equals a C sharp, D flat. E equals a uh, D sharp, E flat. So, uh, so it's like going, the A key is a C. The W key is C sharp. So on and so forth. F is an F coincidentally. T is F sharp. G is a G. Y is a G sharp, A flat. Etc right up on the line. So I'm going to go ahead and record, uh, just put some notes in here for this. Uh, let's listen for a moment and see what we're uh, trying to create. Okay, so this bass player is just going don't, 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 don't. It's like a consistent uh, eighth note pulse. So I'm going to start recording. That was just to get a uh, track going. I'm going to drag this out to the end of the song so I have a MIDI track that's the entire length. And I'll double click on it. Oh, and this is what I was doing wrong before. I didn't, ha I didn't have the loop brace turned on before, so I was trying to change the loop of a length that wasn't even armed. Uh, so it was actually this ending uh, box that I was trying to edit before. So I'm hitting Command-J to make that into one MIDI file. And then here's my piano roll with my E that I just played. I also uh, believe I turned off record quantization, so I want to make sure I turn that on so that every note that I record will be, will come in at, uh, oh no, it did, it came in at 16th note quantization. That's good, even though this is all eighth notes, and I didn't start when the song did. Yes, yeah, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to try clicking these notes in for right now. I'm going to right click, turn my grid to eighth notes so that I know what the eighth note looks like visually. 
and uh, start punching these notes in. I'm going to hit Command B to give me my drawing tool. I should have this uh, eighth note pulse now. Now, like I said later, we're going to swap this for an instrument that's got a little more life to it. Right now, I just want to get the pitches and the rhythms correct, and we'll switch it to a more lifelike sounding bass later on. So I'm going to listen for a moment and see where the chord progression goes next, and then uh, start putting in the rest of the bass. Surprise, surprise, it goes up a fourth. I'm going to fill in the rest of these. Okay, and as often as that repeats, I can just copy and paste it, uh, or just duplicate. So I'm going to select all of this all the way up to the measure where I want it to start repeating at, and hit Command D to duplicate, and it throws in another measure. And then I can select all of those, and duplicate again, and it throws in another four measures. And uh, I'm just going to keep putting notes in until I get a baseline that's done, and you guys can do the same. <laughs> 